It is perhaps an odd thing to hear in church this Sunday, in part because we've all been working so very hard to get back in. But <laughs> the book of Acts is very clear. Go out, <laughs> it says. Go out, get up and go out. God sends Philip out. Not only does God send Philip out, but he sends him down to the lower road, the dangerous road, the wilderness road of, of robbers and of bandits. You never know who you might meet on the road where Philip goes, and most likely it won't be good, at least from Philip's perspective. It was not, uh, as we say, a Psalm 23 road, but rather a moment. It must have been a moment of discomfort for Philip sent out to the wilderness. But there he goes, right? There he goes. He arrives in the wilderness and he comes upon a man of status, a man of loyalty, uncompromised by politics or sordid affairs, one who rises above a trustworthy man, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, we're told, queen of the Ethiopians. The eunuch had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was on a spiritual pilgrimage. He was seeking. Uh, it probably took months to plan, a lot of money, and he too knew the dangers of going on the road, the only road by which he could get there. Once he got to Jerusalem, it's important to understand that he was not allowed into the most religious areas of the city because of his body. Yet, the eunuch went away. He went to Jerusalem to worship. At least he could be closer than he was if he was in Ethiopia. So he was faithful. The eunuch is now on his way home. He is wealthy because, well, we would have known that he was wealthy because he worked for the court, but we also know that he's wealthy because he has a scroll to read. He can read and is reading. He's seated in the chariot, which probably means the chariot's moving, probably that he had a driver. So he's making his way down the road, and Philip is told, as he sees him, to join him. And so he probably, I want you to imagine your mind, runs up to the chariot. So here's the image, the chariot and the eunuch and driver traveling along this deserted road in the wilderness, Philip running beside it, and he hears the man reading aloud. Well, that's partly because we know that people didn't read to themselves until the 17th century. The man is reading Isaiah, Philip knows. And so this is his moment. He says, do you know what you're reading? Perhaps the scroll was new. Perhaps he liked it, even though the eunuch didn't understand it. The powerful and wealthy man realizes this is an important moment for himself, I imagine, and he invites Philip to get in the chariot, come up to a higher place. Philip gets in, and the eunuch begins to pepper him with questions, similar to today's, you know, Christian Ed Hour, I imagine. Maybe not as tough. <laughs> Philip does uh, what Jesus does, though, on the road to Emmaus. In every resurrection account, Philip simply opens the scriptures to the eunuch. He tells him what is happening about God's story, the deliverance of God's people, but also the deliverance that Christ undertakes through crucifixion and resurrection for all people. And as they travel, they come to water. And it is the eunuch who says... Not Philip, the eunuch, who says, why can't I be baptized? The eunuch stops the chariot. The eunuch goes into the water. Philip joins him there, and Philip takes, is, is, is then immediately taken away. Goes somewhere else where the mission takes him. Now, there are here a few important missional practices, I think. We, as part of God's community, are invited to go like Philip. We are invited to go 
into the wilderness, outside the comfort of our home and the comfort of our home church. We are invited to meet others, no matter who they are, where they're from, uh, how they appear, uh, and even if they're headed away from us, we are invited to run alongside. We're invited to walk with them in their pilgrimage wherever they are going, to be curious about them, where they're from, what have they been up to, what are they reading? We are to listen to them and we are to wait to be invited to share the gospel of grace. So oftentimes, I think Christians think we're supposed to go out and just start telling people stuff. But this gives us a different idea. We're supposed to wait and walk. In other words, to have a friendship, a relationship, then to allow the conversation to bubble up from that. And then we should always be ready to baptize, not only to offer the grace and love that's in us, but willing to invite others to come and be baptized if they are eager. We're reminded that in this passage that no formation is needed for baptism. No formation at all. Baptism is free. Baptism is about you believing that God loves you and the church saying, God loves you, so we will baptize you. That's what baptism does. It doesn't require you to receive some kind of mindful acceptance of all 39 articles and the commandments and all. It just says, do you, do you believe God loves you? And if you do, then let's baptize you and confirm that God loves you as the church. This is our work. Now, there are lots of other models of evangelism recorded in Scripture. There's no question about that. This is one form. But it does mean that we should ask ourselves, what does it mean for us? It would be easy to think that this is simply about what it means for us living our church lives. But I want to argue that it's really just about us <laughs> and how we live our life, how we walk with others, how we befriend them, how we are ready to offer ourselves and our experience of the loving God. That's what 1 John tells us, is to see that God loves and that anybody who loves is God, that that's connected deeply, and to be willing to go into the wilderness. And I will tell you, probably the more uncomfortable you feel the more you are likely on the right road. That's the story of Philip, you see. Sometimes we think it's supposed to be easy, right? Sometimes we think, oh, this should be just flow. It shouldn't be uncomfortable. No, it's uncomfortable. You're going to go someplace with somebody you probably never expected to be in line with at the grocery store, at the Chick-fil-A. I don't know where it's going to happen, at a friend's house. As soon as COVID's over, the whole world's going to open up for you. And are you ready? Are you ready for the discomfort that God's inviting you into? To share the gospel of grace. To be revelation yourself. In this particular mission and paradigm, we may invite, but we also need to wait. And wait for those in our lives to desire to desire a confirmation of God's love for them. And that's when we can talk about baptism. In fact, it's one of the most important things that I ask those who can answer for themselves. Do you desire to be baptized? Philip has merely revealed the gospel of grace to the eunuch. That's all. Do you believe in God's love? Do you trust in it? Do you want to live a life where you won't do any evil? These are the questions. We need formation, no question about it, especially as we consider how we might make our witness the reality of growing in faith and our own understanding of the work, of the mission itself, of the service of evangelism, how to help take care of others. But I would suggest our message from Acts invites us to be curious about our mission, to be mindful and it suggests that healthy ministries and healthy mission always involves going out and bearing witness to the love that's in you, waiting for people to be curious, just as you are curious about them, and to understand that going and baptizing are the primary pieces of work 
that the church undertakes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.